Revelation 12. If you open your Bibles to Revelation 12. And uh, the last couple of weeks we've been going through Revelation. And uh, last week we looked at the dragon and Satan and uh, the woman Israel. And then we had worked towards that Israel was the woman that bore the son Jesus Christ. A lot of people, has, you know, I don't know about historically, have said they thought that was the church. The church didn't birth Jesus, so it's a, it is Israel. And today we're looking at Revelation. We're going to finish Revelation chapter 12, verse 7 through 17. In uh, Revelation 12, 7 through 17, I'll go ahead and read the scripture. If uh, Anyone need a Bible out there? Chris just came in. Chris, always happy to deliver a Bible to you. We've got some Bibles over in the corner there, I think. I don't see any hands, Chris, so I think we're set. Uh, Revelation 12, chapter 12, verse 7. And there was war in heaven, Michael and his angels waging war with the dragon. The dragon and his angels waged war. And they were not strong enough, and there was no longer a place found for them in heaven. And the great dragon was thrown down, the serpent of old, who was called the devil, and Satan, who deceives the whole world. He was thrown down to the earth, and his angels were thrown down with him. Then I heard a loud voice in heaven saying, now the salvation and the power and the kingdom of our God and the authority of his Christ have come. For the accuser of our brethren has been thrown down, he who accuses them before our God day and night. And they overcame him because of the blood of the lamb and because of the word of their testimony. And they did not love their life even when faced with death. For this reason, rejoice, O heavens, and you who dwell in them. Woe to the earth and to the sea because the devil has come down to you having great wrath, knowing that he has only a short time. And when the dragon saw that he was thrown down to the earth, he persecuted the woman who gave birth to the male child. But the two wings of a great eagle were given to the woman so that she could fly into the wilderness to her place, where she was nourished for a time and times and half a time from the presence of the serpent. And the serpent poured water like a river out of his mouth and the woman so that she might cause her to be swept away with a flood. And the earth helped the woman, and the earth opened its mouth to drink up the river which the dragon poured out in his mouth. So the dragon was enraged with the woman and went off to make war with the rest of her children who keep the commandments of God and who hold the testimony of Jesus. I'm going to just pray to the Spirit would open up this text to us today as we study and work through here. Would you pray with me? Father, we thank you for the words you've given us in your holy book. We thank you for the Bible. We thank you for the cross. We thank you for the blood of Jesus Christ. Father, we ask your Holy Spirit would lead us in truth as we open this passage and unpack it and look at the truth you would have us to understand. Father, forgive me where we fail to properly understand your word. Just give us wisdom and understanding and discernment as we study this passage. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Well, I titled this, The War to End All Wars. Uh, we, often there's been wars in the past, World War I, World War II, and they said, if we have this last war, then war will end. War's never going to end as long as there's people on the earth until this war. There's going to be a war one day where Jesus Christ returns to this earth and makes everything right. Does it ever feel when you wake up that everything's wrong? <laughs> Sometimes it feels we wake up and we read the news, we have the TV on or the news or you read a headline or you hear something on a face snap, Facebook, Snapchat, snap look, yeah, whatever they're called. Facebook, I call it fake book anymore, but yeah, but uh, you, you see stuff and, and you're stunned and it takes you back a little bit and you're like, how can that be? And, and it's because we live in a fallen world. But one day, I think what all of our hearts are looking for is that one day Christ returns and makes everything right in heaven and on earth. And we realize that's not perfectly right today, but that day is coming. Oh, what a glorious day it will be when my Jesus at last I shall see. When we look on his face, the one that saved me by his grace, what a glorious day that will be. I love that song. Another song I love, when we all get to heaven, a friend of mine, his wife passed away this week. And uh, we, we have, we suffer human loss. We suffer physical life loss of loved ones. And I almost invariably say what a glorious day it will be when we all get to heaven. Who, who likes that song? When we all get to heaven, what a glorious day that will be. One day that's coming. We sing about it. We literally have songs about that day. But we're not there yet. And as we look through this passage, uh, as the uh, scriptures are unfolded to us in Revelation, this is a, it's moving us toward that day 
So we look here in verse 7 of chapter 12, and it says, there, there was a war in heaven, Michael and his angels waging war with the dragon, and the dragon and the angels waged war. Reading this in a little bit better context, again, we're not in English class here. We, we are about preaching the Bible. But it, it's, it would maybe better read, and there was a war in heaven that Michael had to engage in. It was, there was an action going on that Michael and his angels had to get involved in. And what, what it tells us is there was something that, that caused this action of Michael getting involved. Michael, almost throughout the scriptures, is almost always listed. I could find no place he's not listed as a warrior angel. Angels, we know, means messenger. God uses angels to be messengers. Michael, it seems he is uh, an angel that comes with a sword and sorts things out. Who likes Michael? <laughs> you know, yeah, I love when things get sorted out. But we see that, and remember when, when in, uh, in Daniel, the book of Daniel where uh, Daniel prayed and he, the angel came and said, you know, for these 21 days you've been praying and I couldn't get to you because the prince of Persia, we've talked about that, there, that was not a human being. That was a spiritual power, an evil power of darkness that has sway over the geographic region that we call Persia or Iran, Iraq, the Middle East. Is that spirit alive and well today? Is this a little louder than usual? I'm getting a lot of feedback up here. Could you all turn this mic down a little bit? It's just a little loud. I could hear it coming back. In any event, we know that there's a, a demonic power there. And so the angel comes and says, you know, I couldn't get to you, Daniel. But does anyone remember the story? It says, but the angel tells Daniel, but God sent Michael to defeat the prince of Persia, to, to push through him and to get me to you. So that's unusual language for us in Protestant circles. We're talking about angelic warfare. Is there angelic warfare? We just read and there was a war in heaven. Michael and his angels waging war with the dragon. The dragon and his, it does use the word angels, you might even want to put their demons, waged war. There was a war going on. Is there a war going on today? Are you in a war? We, we, we cannot forget the world we live in that we do not battle with flesh and blood. We battle with spiritual darkness, with powers, with evil in high places. There is a prince of this world, a prince of darkness, that seems to have some control over it a little bit right now. But as long as that control's there, we realize something's not quite right. Well, this passage we're looking at today is showing where Jesus Christ is slowly but surely, slow, uh, slowly by our standards, right on schedule by his standards. <laughs> so when I say slowly, I want to preface that with what we seem to be slow. God, why are you not solving this sooner? God has a plan. He has a, a plan far better than our plan. Often when people say, why doesn't God come back today? I can't help but think that he knows that in a month or two or six or a year, there's one of his lost lambs that's going to come to Jesus Christ and come to repentance, and he's waiting judgment for that one more sheep to come into the fold. And so while we're enduring here on earth temporary difficulties, Paul says that we count these present difficulties as nothing compared to the glories he has for a stored in heaven. Now, when Paul wrote that, think of what he's been through. Did Paul get called names at work? Did he work with someone that used bad language or smoke? Or I hear people, My, I got a burden, someone I work with smokes. If that's your burden, you got, that's a light burden, I think. Paul had been shipwrecked. He had been beaten. He had been whipped. He had been left for dead. He'd been stoned. He'd been chased throughout all of the Middle East with people trying to kill him. The Pharisees wanted to kill him. Everyone was after him. He's, he'd been in prison time. And, and after going through all of that, here's his response. I count these current things I'm dealing with as nothing. When you weigh this, what we go through here on earth today with what God's prepared for us in heaven, this is nothing. And we have to remember that. It might be difficult. It's hard. It's not, there's no might be about it. It is difficult. It is hard. But this is just but for a season. Think, what etern when does eternity stop? Never. This one day will stop. So there's a war going on. And the dragon takes an action that causes Michael and the angels to take action. And they go to war against the dragon. And, the, and verse 8 says, And the dragon, they, is the dragon and his angels, they were not strong enough. And there was no longer a place found for them in heaven. Now, this is going to mess with some of y'all's theology. But do you know that Satan today has access to heaven? I'm waiting for some of the, what? What'd you say, Willis? Yeah. I'm seeing who older people are. 
<laughs> but if you look at Job, remember it says in Job chapter 1, the sons of God came up to heaven and was talking to God, and the devil also went. And then he's, we're going to see in this passage a little bit, it says, he that accuses the brethren daily. The day is going to come when Jesus does tell devil, the devil, you are no longer welcome ever in heaven. What's his point when he goes to heaven today to talk to God? To accuse the brethren. We just read that. There's going to be a day when Jesus says, I'm done with your nonsense. You ever been there? Someone's talking, you finally say, I'm done. I am done with listening. That day's coming. And so, again, that messes with our theology a little bit. We see several places in the Bible, it does say that the devil is speaking to God in heaven. And again, I, I, I told you that place in Job, and I'm telling you this place here in Revelation. So if you're like, well, I just never, th that's not true. If the Bible says it happened, what are you going to believe? I'm going to, I always believe the Bible. So that messes with my theology a little bit too with, what do you mean the devil has access to heaven? The Bible says he does. That doesn't sound right, does it? Well, one day he won't have access to heaven anymore. And that's what this war is here. It says the war and the dragon, it says they were, they were not strong enough. And the great dragon was thrown down, the serpent of old, in verse 9, who was called the devil and Satan, who deceives the whole world. And he was thrown down to the earth, and his angels were thrown down with him. I believe this is the middle of the tribulation period, where the devil no longer and his demons have access to both realms. They're going to be 100% totally captive to this world. They will not be able to exist in heaven anymore. And when that happens, do you think the devil's power will be magnified when all of his demons are here? And we've seen as we've gone through Revelation that the great abyss was open and 200,000, what John described as the locusts that had power to sting people and hurt people and, and cause them misery and difficulties, there's 200,000. We saw another place which, depending on your, your understanding, it could be a human army, it could be a demonic army, of another 200,000. There's Myriad and myriad or thousands times thousands times thousands times thousands of angels in heaven. And it says when the devil left, he took a third with him. So does the devil have a pretty big army? But for every one of them, there's two angels. This is the third went. That means two-thirds stayed. So when it has war here, it says they were not strong enough, and there was no longer a place found for them in heaven. They were All of them, them, there was no longer a place for them in heaven. They were kicked out to this earth. And that, well, that's what we just read in verse 9. They were thrown down to the earth. His angels were thrown down with him. Then I heard a loud voice in heaven saying, Now the salvation and power and the kingdom of our God and the authority of his Christ have come. For the accuser of our brethren has been thrown down. He who accuses them before our God day and night. So again, if you read that verse, it says the devil has been thrown down. When, when this day comes, when Michael and the angels throw the devil and all those demons, they have no more realm at all in heaven. There's no room found for them at all, and they're thrown down. Do you think the saints that are in heaven will be happy about that? I think they will be. And, and the reason I say that, people say, well, who are these that are saying this? I will tell you, I believe this is saints. I believe this is Christians in heaven. Because if you read it, it says, now the salvation and power and kingdom of our God, are angels saved they're not saved in the sense, they're safe, but they're not saved in the sense that Christ died for them. We're saved. We have salvation. We praise God for salvation. Angels might say, God, you're an awesome being for saving those sinners that aren't worthy. Would those angels be telling the truth? They would be telling the truth. So they might praise him for giving salvation. They don't know salvation. I don't, theologically, I don't know how accurate this is. I do remember my grandfather, I've heard other people say this. When they're in heaven and the heavenly choir is singing, the angels are singing, and we start singing Amazing Grace. Does an angel have any concept of the grace we've received? They don't. They don't know what it is to have Jesus die for their sins. We do. Jesus loves those angels, but you know that third of the angels that he cast out? He didn't die for them. He's got a place for them, reserved for them. Aren't you glad as a redeemed child of God, he's got a place reserved for you? Can you say today there's a new name written down in heaven and it's mine? Oh, yes, it's mine. Aren't you glad your name is written in the Lamb's Book of Life? If it's not, make sure today is the day of salvation for you. 
If you're here, if you're at home, if you're watching in the future, whatever it is, something so simple as the thief on the cross, remember me. And Jesus said, today you'll be with me in paradise. So there's a day coming when he gets kicked out of heaven, never allowed to return. All of heaven rejoices. It says, the salvation and the power and the kingdom of our God and the authority of his Christ have come for the accuser of our brethren. Angels are never considered brethren. So that's why I said I believe this is, and I'm pretty confident, these are believers. The accuser of our brothers. You know that Satan loves to accuse us, doesn't he? He will even get in your head. He'll accuse your brain and to accuse you of yourself. You're not good. You're not worthy. You're not a good Christian. You don't tithe. You lie. You cheat. You speed. You have bad thoughts. Would he be right? That's the, that's the part that's the amazing grace. These aren't false accusations. If we're honest with ourselves... I think we would say those are accurate accusations. There are people that we don't get along with and wish maybe evil on them. Maybe we do lie. Maybe we do cheat. Maybe we do have impure thoughts. Maybe we do have little pet sins that we deal when no one's, we do when no one's around us and we keep it secret and no one knows. There's one who knows. And the one that knows is the one that we should be the most afraid of. And I will use that word, afraid of. Because does the, does the Lord have power to discipline His children? No one likes discipline, do they? <laughs> but there's even some amazing grace in that. The God says, you know what? I know you hate discipline. You despise it. You don't like it. But I love you enough. Guess what? Here's the belt. <laughs> Here's the discipline. Because a father who loves his child will discipline his child. And if you're going through some discipline, you can thank the Lord that he loves you and getting that discipline. And it's hard. That's a hard pill to swallow because that goes against every fiber of our being. I want discipline. But boy, is it good when you come to the Lord and say, Lord, create in me a new heart. Purge me of all my iniquity. Beat me with hyssop and make my sins as white as snow. When you come to that point, that's usually the point the Lord says the discipline can stop now. That's where I wanted you to, to repent and turn from your sins and turn to me. And when you mean that from your heart, Lord, forgive me a sinner, he, he is so glad for you to say that and rejoices. He certainly rejoices the first time you do it and you come to him as your savior. But even after we're saved, I think we all have to agree we still, boy, I'd like to say stumble and make mistakes and choose poorly. Wouldn't we like to use those kind of words? Sometimes we just flat out choose sin. It's sin and we know it and we choose it. And he still loves us. That's amazing love, amazing grace. So these folks in heaven, I believe they're, they're fellow brothers and sisters of ours. It says salvation and power and the kingdom of our God and the authority of his Christ have come for the accuser of our brethren has been thrown down. He who accuses them before our God day and night. I really wish that word false accusations was in there, but it's not. He accuses us and he's correct. Some of you might have saw I put on Facebook yesterday, you know, the, you know, like a, it's almost like a trial going on here. He accuses God like in a trial setting. And the DA comes in and says, you're guilty of all these things. I've got boxes and boxes and boxes and file cabinets of sins on you. And as you open those files and you look through those files, yep, yep, correct, I did that, I thought that, I said that. It's all correct. How glad are we when the real Supreme Court, the highest judge, the Supreme Judge, picks up that gavel and we are scared to death and he bangs it down and says not guilty. Not guilty. Innocent, righteous, justified. And then he grabs the DA and he's going to kick him out of the courtroom forever. Where's the accuser going to be when he's kicked out? No charges against us anymore. 
full righteousness, not based on us, based 100% on the blood of Christ. And we cling to that old rugged cross and we plead the blood for our forgiveness of sins and we overcome the accusations of the devil through the blood of the lamb, which we're going to see in a moment. So he's thrown down, he who accuses them before our God. Is the devil persistent? He, is pers- he says he accuses before God day and night. He doesn't let up. And dear child of God, if you're fighting that guilt that you've been forgiven of and the devil's in your head, he'll accuse you before God. He'll accuse you to yourself too. You're no good because. You can't because. You know you did this. You're not worthy of God's grace. Devil, you're right. You are 100% correct. I'm not worthy, but praise God, he died for me anyway. I'm forgiven. Don't carry around that old baggage of guilt. If you've repented and turned, don't carry it around with you. I, I promise you, brother and sister, you will have a weak Christian testimony and a weak Christian life saying, I'm saved by grace, I'm forgiven by God, but I'm broke and can't do anything, and I, God can't use me because. There might be some things he can't use you in, but we all have different assignments. He, you can be used greatly in the assignment he gives you. But you've got to find out what that assignment is. And if the devil gets in your mind, you can't serve because. You can't be an Iwana leader. How can you go in there on Sunday night and listen to those little kids say verses when on Monday morning you said X, Y, Z? Lord, forgive me a sinner for saying X, Y, Z. Use me for your kingdom. I come to you with a broken heart. God says, get in there and listen to those little Iwana kids say verses. Does God want those little kids saying verses, memorizing the Bible? Thy word have I hid in my heart? For what reason? Thy word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against you. If you don't know the rules, how are you going to follow them? And I've said this last Sunday, every time the devil came to Jesus, jump off the building, kneel down before me, make these rocks into bread. Every time Jim just hit the nail on the head, Jesus said what? Did Jesus know the word? To quote it, you got to know it. He is the word. And he said, it is written, it is written, it is written. You know, the spirit, when Jesus was out in the wilderness, the, the, the devil came and uh, tried to mess him up. And an interesting verse over in Luke, in uh, Luke 22, no, Luke, uh, Luke 4, 13, if you have your note taking, I'll just read this. Luke 4.13, after the devil had tempted the Lord, is in Luke chapter 4. And after he was tempted, uh, and I'll just pick up here in verse, it says verse 11. uh, Well, verse, verse 10, it says, for it is written in the last one, he said he will command his angels concerning you to guard over you. Remember this one, the devil said, jump off this mountain and everyone will see you and the angels come down and swoop you up and you will be a glorious, you know, Messiah, and the people will see you and worship you because they see the angels swoop down and take you. Can the devil quote scripture? That's what he did here. He said, the devil's telling Jesus, it's written. Can he get in our minds? If we don't know, if we don't have discernment, can the devil twist us up with it is written? And that's what he's trying to do Jesus here. He, he tempted him. Jesus said, it is written. He tempted him. Jesus said, it is written. The third one, he tempts him and Jesus says, it is written. He says, yeah, but it's also written that you can jump off and the angels won't let you even hurt your feet. They'll swoop down and, and the world will see you, get rescued from angels, and the world will bow before you. Is that why Jesus wants people to bow before him? Because he's a spectacular Messiah? No, he wants them to come to him as Jesus Christ, the atoning sacrifice for their sins. So he could have had everything. The devil said, I'll give you the, all the kingdoms of the world. I can't help but think when the devil told him that, Jesus said, well, you know, one day I'm going to come back and take all the kingdoms of the world. And the kingdom, we saw this last week, and it said the kingdoms of the world became his kingdom. So it's kind of silly offering Jesus what Jesus already owns. (laughs) You know, one day, if you'll kneel before me, Jesus, I'll give you this whole world. Jesus, I can't help but think he's, (laughs) devil, You you remember, I'm the one that created you. 
We all have this saying sometimes, but literally, not figuratively, we might say this to our kids, but literally, could Jesus say, Satan, I brought you into this world, <laughs> and guess what? <laughs> I can take you out. <laughs> and we're looking forward to that day. I don't know if you are. I'm looking forward to that day when Jesus says, I brought you in, and guess what? Yeah, I can take you out. But then it goes on, it says in Luke 4 here, uh, it says in verse 12, it says, And Jesus answered and said to him, It is said you shall not test the Lord your God. So Jesus comes back, when the devil comes back with a scripture, Jesus comes back with scripture on top of it. Can people use scripture and twist the meaning? Now, do we ever do that? Sometimes we get, we get, that's why we need discernment. We need wisdom when we study the word. God, I not only want to know the word, I want to properly understand the word and correctly handle the word of truth that you've given me. Because a scalpel in the hands of someone that doesn't know how to use it can be a weapon, right? But a scalpel in the hands of a doctor or a surgeon can give life. But you give a little four, five, six-year-old child a scalpel with a razor blade on and says, start stabbing people, can that cause pain? So we, we do have the truth. We've all, the world knows this saying, the truth hurts. The truth can hurt. But what are we told in Ephesians 4.15? Speak the truth in love. We've got to have used the word correctly. Sometimes things do need to get excised. Things need to be said, that's sin, and it's only sin, and there's no good thing in that situation. Sometimes we've got to be bold. Sometimes we've got to be soft, and that's where discernment comes in. That's knowing the Word and using it properly. 2 Timothy 2.15, study the Word to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, correctly handling the Word of truth. But I, I'm going to get to this verse because it's an interesting verse in Luke 4. And then verse 12 says, Jesus says, You shall not test the Lord your God. And look at verse 13. It says, When the devil had finished every temptation, he left Jesus until a more opportune time. We miss that verse sometimes. We think sometimes, well, Jesus was tested those three times that 40 days in the wilderness, and the devil went and left them alone. That's not what Scripture says. It says the devil came back to a more opportune time. Sunday morning, you might be here today saying, man, I'm focused. I want to do the Lord's will. I want to be a perfect uh, a disciple of the Lord, a perfect a follower of Jesus Christ, a perfect obeyer of his word. But you would have happens tomorrow morning at 7 o'clock on Monday? The devil comes along because now you're not surrounded by a heavenly host of witnesses. Now you're not guarded by angelic beings literally flying around us right now, watching and looking at the things we're talking about. I think when we say amazing grace, how sweet the sound, there may be a, a spiritual realm around us. I know there is a spiritual realm around us. This says, what are those people talking about? Well, there's a scripture that says the angels look upon these things with intent, interest. How? And I can't help but understand the mind of an angel with Hold on a second, Jesus. You, you died for Dale? You went to earth and had the Father turn his back on you for him? Those, those people that you call humans that are made a little lower than the angels? Why would you die for that one? I have no answer. I have no answer why Jesus would die for me. Other than his great love for me. Because no logic... No rationale, no reasoning would conclude us to the story of the cross. It's as though we have to accept it by faith. Our logic fails us in those areas. Because logically, we wouldn't do that. Because it's illogical. It makes no sense. Why would the righteous one of God die for the unrighteous people of the world? For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. It's not based on us. When you think about why would God do this for me, the devil will start having time in your brain. I would encourage you when that happens, God didn't do it for me. He did it because that's his nature. God did it for him. When, you're, when you go to your prayer, you might say, Lord, there is no reason to forgive me of this sin that I've committed over and over and over and over, and over, and over, and over, and over. I plead the blood. Amen. 
Not because of who I am or what I've done, but because of who you are and what Jesus has done. I come to you on those grounds. God will listen to that prayer when you come on those grounds. When you come with the blood, God will receive that offering. When you come by yourself, he won't. So we pick up here in verse 11, it says, and, they, and we just, we've been talking about this this whole time. How do we overcome? Verse 11, and they overcame him, the devil, Christians, the believers that were accused by the devil, they overcame him by the blood of the lamb and their testimony, of the word of their testimony. So when the devil comes and knocks you down, Satan, I plead the blood. This is the word of my testimony. There is no good thing in me. You're right, devil, I did do this. But I plead the blood. I'm overcoming you by the blood of the Lamb and the word of my testimony. And my testimony is Jesus died for me. He was buried and he rose again. He's coming back. So if you've got a problem, maybe you'd like to go talk to Jesus about it. <laughs> maybe he's the one you should be going talking to about me. That's how we overcome the devil. And when that sin sneaks up on you in that opportune time, where the devil walks around like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. Oh, now you're weak. Now you're not with these people. Now you're not covered in the blood. Now you're out in the world. Now you're hanging out at the workplace or with your friends or you're down at the local honky-tonk or wherever you are. Now there's an opportune time. Now I can plant that seed. Now I can get you to go the wrong way. You need to see that trap coming. Whoa, 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 devil. That's not what I'm about. It is written, it's written Jesus loved me and he died for me. He poured his precious blood out on a cross for my sins and my sins are covered. Ooh, the devil doesn't like those kind of conversations. <laughs> he, as a matter of fact, he hates those kind of, As a matter of fact, if you resist the devil, you know what he'll do? He'll flee from you. That's what James tells us. Resist the devil and he will flee. How do we resist? Chapter 12, verse 11. Overcome him by the blood and the word of your testimony. If you go to the devil and say, you know, I'm a pretty good person. I believe in good works and doing right. And I'm going to beat the devil by just being a, a, a self-righteous person. He has got you right where he wants you. He has got you perfectly in place. Lord, I'm a good person. I go to church on Sundays, devil. I give tithes and offerings. You don't have any accusation of me because I'm good. Boy, is it, this sounds good, though. I mean, it sounds reasonable. You know, there's a whole bunch of, there's thousands of fake man-made religions that say that. There's only one true religion, the one given to us by God in the Bible through Jesus Christ. No man comes to the Father but through me. Amen. That's the only real religion in the good sense of the word. Everyone else is a fake copy. Every other religion is a self-righteous, I did it, God owes me. When you get to heaven and God says, why do you listen? What are you going to say? I'm going to say because I did the five pillars of Islam. He has to let me in. He owes it to me. I'm going to do it because I lit a candle. God's going to let me in because I did. I burned my body and gave it to the, all my soul, all my stuff, gave it to the poor. He's let, he, oh, he has to let me in because I. Whole lot of religions doing that. I told people if they give more money, that they'll get a brand new Cadillac and a big house, prosperity gospel. That's why God lets me in. Nope. You better have one answer and only. I, gave, I said a couple months ago that guy that came in and Peter said, this is a fake story, by the way. And Peter said, <laughs> why does God let you in? He said, well, I gave my life to be burned. I sold all my possessions. I was in church every Sunday. I was a Sunday school teacher. Uh, I, I gave my tithes and offerings regularly. I helped people. I fed people. I visited people in prison. I did all these things, and that's why God lets me in. And Peter says, get out. You're not welcome. And the next guy comes up, and he says, Ugh, wow. If that guy did all that stuff and he didn't let him in, the only way I'm getting is by the grace of God. And the pearly gates opened up. Because <laughs> the only way we're getting in is by the grace of God. So when we see someone, we say, therefore, but the grace of God go I, that is a real statement. But therefore, but by the grace of God go I. That could be that exact same person if it wasn't for God's grace. Verse 13, and when the dragon saw that he was thrown down to the earth, he persecuted the woman or Israel and gave, that gave birth to the male child. But God supplied two wings of a great eagle were given to the woman so that she could fly into the wilderness to her place where she was nourished for a time 
and times and times a half, that's three and a half years, from the presence of the serpent. Now, th this passage here, we, you know, there's a lot of, we don't know exactly. Here's what I do know. God will protect Israel during the tribulation. God will provide a way. I don't know. People say, was this two wings America? Because the eagle, I have no idea. I don't know. Is he going to send airplanes to whisk them out of that area that, that, that Satan's per persecuting them and take them to... Uh, it does say in the Old Testament that Edom and Ammon and Moab will be safe in those days. Talking about the day of the Lord. Edom is what we would call today Jordan. It's the other side. It's Esau's descendants went over to the Jordan area. Today on a map, if you look at the area of Jordan, that would be Edom, Moab, and the, and the uh, Ammonites. And it says that Israel would flee to those areas. Some people said it would be Petra, the city of Petra, that God would let them in there. If you've ever seen that, it's the opening or one of the scenes in Raiders of the Lost Ark where you have a canyon, and in some places that canyon gets real thin. You can barely get a single horse and rider through it. It's all covered in rocks. And it would be an extremely well-defensible position. I was listening to a sermon on this some time ago, and I'm told that uh, Christians in the Jordan today, they actually hide Bibles in there. They go in, and they'll plant Bibles in little cubby holes and do stuff with the thinking that one day if Israel's in this village or in this city that's carved into the rock, an entire culture of the city of Petra, we want Bibles here so they can read them and understand. What they planted, the Essenes, back 2,000 years ago, that we know today is the Dead Sea Scrolls, they said, let's take this word and let's put it in Petra so if they get here, because the, there's evidence of it, because the Bible does say they'll, go, they'll flee to Edom, which is where Jordan is, and that which is where Petra is. And so I don't want to go too far on that because it's speculative, but if you, this is another one of those things, like I said last week, if you put the pieces together, they do seem to fit, and they don't seem to be uh, unique or different from another piece of Scripture. It seems the more Scriptures you look at, those pieces do fit together well. There's no piece of Scripture that says they're not fleeing to Edom. If it said that, I'd say it can't be Edom because the Bible says it can't be Edom. But it does say they will flee to Edom. So we don't know exactly. Maybe they could flee to the United States. Maybe they could flee to who knows where. Again, people say the eagle. We just don't know. So I'm hesitant to be definitive on what this means. But here's what I do know. Israel will be protected. That's what we do know. Verse 14, as I just read, but the two wings of a great eagle were given to the woman so that she could fly into the wilderness to her place where she would be nourished, taken care of. Could she be out in Petra and could God just do something crazy like just have bread drop out of the sky and take care of Israel? Could he do something like have quail just pile up and have all the quail they want? I wonder if they would have bacon. Could he have bacon fly out of the sky with those quail? And have bacon wrapped quails. <laughs> I think he could. Yeah, when pigs, when pigs fly. Yeah, that, that's... <laughs> I'm going to work on that. There's a joke there, yeah. Could he have bacon just fly out of the sky? Yeah, he could. God can do whatever he wants. He's God. But we do know he'll be taken care of. And interestingly, this word nourished, it's, it is the word we would think nourishment, but could it also be spiritual nourishment? Could he provide for them and take care of them and, and give them physical nourishment as well as spiritual nourishment? And have the Holy Spirit come talk to them and build them for that three and a half years and, and, and move the Spirit of God and let those dry bones come to life and breathe life into them. Could he do that? Yes. Yeah, absolutely he could. Verse 15 says, And the serpent poured water. I tell you, I looked at this and looked and looked. There's nothing that I can find that says anything that I can definitively see. But what I've kind of myself just come, kind of come with this might mean. The serpent poured water like a river out of his mouth after the woman. It doesn't say it is a river. It says it's like a river. So we know by the imagery and the language of the text we're in, symbolic language, that these things aren't dis distinctly or, or perfectly two wings of an eagle or a serpent or a river. It's things like this. It's a sign. When, when you see a sign when you go into another state and it says entering Alabama or something, for example, you realize that's not Alabama. That sign's a, who's blinking? Could you turn it off? Because I see how everyone in the room is now looking at you. <laughs> Usually if it's just real quick and you get rid of it, we don't say anything. I keep moving. But when the whole room starts, I start losing. <laughs> but in any event, so it's a sign, but that sign that says Alabama is not Alabama. 
It's a sign. So when we see here, it says it's a sign, or I saw a vision like. And it says here, but here's what I came to the conclusion of my own uh, kind of with the Holy Spirit, I hope. And I'm being cautious because I don't know definitively, but, and I didn't see this anywhere. But what comes out of the devil's mouth? Lies. Could you say a river of lies? A flood of lies? So I kind of think this, what comes out of the devil's mouth, and the servant poured water like a river out of his mouth, what comes out of his mouth is lies. Could he, the devil, one day have the world hate Israel because of lies? We have all these problems because of those Jews. Hollywood's controlled by those Jews. I was talking to a guy, a Muslim guy one time, and I was sharing the Bible with him, and he said, well, it's not, you know, they believe that it was Ishmael put on the altar with Abraham and not Isaac. And that, that's well, right here it says that it was Isaac, the son of promise, was put on the altar. We don't believe that because you know who wrote that Bible? Who? The Jews. They twisted it up on us. I mean, that's something I've heard in my lifetime straight from someone that believes that 100% that Ishmael was the son put on the altar that Abraham sacrificed, not Isaac. And then, and then, but it's, and, and, it's, and where in the history of the world have the Jews not been persecuted? I said this last Sunday, I did some work this week, that last Sunday I said, has there any, ever been a nation in the history of the world persecuted more than Israel? And simply because of the time Israel's been around, 4,000 years, no other nation, you know, very few other nations could. I was listening to a sermon and I, I looked it up and did some research on this, that Benjamin Netanyahu was talking to Xi Jinping, the leader of China. And they were talking about some different things, and it came up about Israel and the persecution of Israel in the world. And Benjamin Netanyahu said, you know, we've been around 4,000 years, and Xi Jinping said, the head of China, said, well, you know, China's been around 5,000 years. We're an older people than you. And India's been around 5,000 years. The people of India have been around 5,000 years. They're an older people. We have records back before Abraham that we were around longer than you, and Benjamin Netanyahu said, you know the difference, though, between those three cultures that have been around the long as the world can know, China, India, and Israel? China has 1.2 billion people. India has over a billion. Israel has 13 million. Why do you think we've been around almost as long as you, and you have 1.2 billion, and we have 13 million? That really put in perspective, has Israel suffered? Nations or people groups, I should say, not nations, but people groups that were around a little bit longer than Israel have a billion people. And Benjamin Netanyahu said there's another difference. The people in China were always allowed to live in China. The people in India were always allowed to live in India. The people of Israel have not always been allowed to live in Israel. We were a people without a home. You have a billion, we have 13 million. Interesting, I did, some, I did some more work on this. All the Jews that, there's a, there's a uh, I can't think of the group, there's a group that if you have a certain Jewish percentage, the nation of Israel will fly you to Israel, that you can one day stand in Israel, see the sites, and they fly you back home. They, they bring all the people for their Israel. And it says to meet that definition of those people, 51% of all the Jews in the world today, do you know where they live? the United States of America, 51%. 30% live in Israel. That, that kind of caught me off guard with, there's more Jews that live here than live in Israel? That was kind of, kind of was like, that was odd. So 81% of all the Jews in the world live in the United States and Israel. You look at France, 3%. Canada, 3%. France, 3%. England, 3%. Other developed nations, wouldn't, why wouldn't they be in the 50s? Like, or they couldn't be in the 50s. Like Five nations had 50%. <laughs> but why wouldn't they have so much more? Do you teach math? Do you teach math? You're the only one that laughed when I said that. <laughs> the math teacher got, you can't have five people doing 50%. But in any event, but I thought maybe this, and that's kind of got me back with this, a great wings were given where they could go and be safe. You know, maybe it is America. I don't know. I, I, I'm going to be very hesitant to say that. But more than half live here, which I just thought was odd. And then when you look at the other developed nations of the world, 3%, 1% in France, 
1% in Germany. Why do you think there's so few people in Germany? What happened a generation ago? Yeah. There, there's still people alive today. I saw my timeline the other day. Uh, I was in a, getting a, my, my, uh, a haircut up in Conroe. It's the oldest barber shop in Texas. And uh, they had a plaque on the wall, the longest continuous up. By, and there was a guy in there. He was 98, served in World War II. And I was able to sit, and I just talked to him a little bit. And he said, I remember what, you know, when we went in to those prison camps. I saw the pictures when they were fresh and what, the, what the Germany was doing to Israel. That's persecution. I don't blame Germany for that. I hope you don't either. Who do we blame? Who? Here's what it says. The serpent poured out water like a river out of his mouth after the woman so caused her to be swept away and drowned. That's the devil. We don't fight against the nation of Germany. That's flesh and blood. We don't fight them. The devil's behind this. Verse 16 says, But the earth helped the woman, and the earth opened its mouth and drank up the river which the dragon poured out of its mouth. I was thinking also about all the lies that the devil says. And then with that, Romans tells us, For since the creation of the world... God's invisible qualities, His eternal power, divine nature, have been clearly seen, being understood from what has been made, so that people are without excuse. So when the devil says there is no God, the world, Romans tells us the world says there is a God. People can look at the created world and say there has to be a God. Because look at it. To have a painting, you must have a painter. To have a building, you must have a builder. To have a drum player, you have to have a, to have a creation, there must be a creator. Our minds naturally come to that conclusion. So with the devil spewing these lies, there is no God, the world says, oh yes, there is. And of course, you might remember the famous Psalm 19.1, the heavens declare the glory of the Lord. So when Satan puts these lies out, the world itself consumes those lies and says, that's not true. And if you're reasonable, and you're looking for truth, nature will give you general revelation. There is a God. That's what according to the scriptures tell us. So when the dragon could not attack Israel anymore, God's protected Israel at this future time, puts, puts Israel in the wilderness, nourishes Israel. The devil can no longer attack Israel. Verse 17 says, so the dragon was enraged and the woman, and w with the woman, and went off to make war with the rest of her children, who keep the commandments of God, and who hold fast to the testimony of Jesus. So when the devil can't attack Israel, who's he going to attack? The church. You ever heard, you know, Adolf Hitler, I think it was him or one of his henchmen or somebody there said, whatever you're doing, accuse the other side of doing, because it'll muddy the waters. If you steal, you start saying, that other side's stealing. If you lie, the other side's lying. Whatever you're doing, accuse the other side. And you get people say, well, you know, every, that both sides are doing that. Well, no, both sides aren't doing that. One side's doing it. One side's accusing the other side of doing it. You're believing the accusation. So here, do you ever heard someone say the great evil dragon, America, and the little dragon, Israel? What, what do they call us? The great evil Satan. There's people in the world that say America is the great evil Satan, Israel is the little Satan. Well, guess who's accusing us of that? Satan. He's accusing us of who he is. It's interesting that Adolf Hitler, and again, I don't know if it was Adolf, it was one of his people that said, whatever you're doing, accuse the other side of doing. Because it'll muddy the waters. People cause so much chaos and confusion, people won't know what the truth is anymore. Do you feel like in our world today it's hard to find the truth? It's hard to discern when you read a headline what's really going on. The truth is getting harder to find. But folks, I promise you, the truth is in this book. The truth is Jesus Christ. He's the only truth. Every single problem, every single puzzle, every single heartache that this earth has to offer, Jesus is the solution. Would you bow with me? Father, we thank you for this message today. We thank you for protecting your people, Israel. And we thank you, Father, for the protection you've given the church in America these last decades and years. 
Father, we do believe that, uh, I believe anyway, that there is persecution coming. We know from Revelation that we just read that the devil will turn to those and persecute those that hold to your commandments and give testimony of Jesus Christ. So we know that we're in his crosshairs, Father. I pray for those today that are battling the devil and his demons, that you strengthen them. Father, your word supplies us with the full armor of God, the helmet of salvation, the sword of the spirit, the breastplate of righteousness, the belt of truth, feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of truth. Father, we ask that you equip each of us properly with these instruments of war and help us to realize we are in a spiritual battle. It's easy for it to get. We get so wrapped up in the world and the things of the world, we forget there are men and women, boys and girls around us dying, going to heaven, uh, going to hell, not hearing about Jesus Christ. Help us, Father, to keep focus on the gospel. Help us keep first things first at Autumn Creek, the gospel of Jesus Christ. We thank you for this message today, Father, in Jesus' name I pray, amen.